everyone, and welcome to the Rich Life Podcast. This is Pastor Jordan Clark here. We are going to share with you our sermon from our church gathering on September 18th. We had an amazing gathering last night uh, where we met some new people, and we've been getting a good, consistent amount of people coming out, and it's been awesome. Uh, if you missed us last night, you weren't at our gathering, we missed you. I uh, want to remind you that we meet every Monday night at 7 p.m. at Stone Throw Coffee Collective in Regina, Saskatchewan. Everyone is welcome to join us. We always do biblical teaching, discussion. We take communion together. We remind ourselves of why we're meeting in our community. And uh, we just love worshiping God together. So you're always welcome to join us. and. We have our podcast here in case you miss our teachings so that you can look back on uh, our past teachings and see what we've taught and see what we've shared. And you can grow together as we worship God and teach his word and learn his word together. You might see some weeks where we don't have any weeks posted because sometimes we do special events like we did a barbecue last week. So we didn't have a formal sermon. We shared the gospel. We hung out together. We invited people to come back to Enrich, uh, and that was last week. And so that's why you you might see some weeks where we don't have sermons. But today, we are back at it, and I'm actually becoming more organized, becoming a bit more disciplined. Uh, we are going to start posting a little bit more on our podcast, our socials, uh, where we po- might do some mini teachings, mini things where... We're teaching you how to engage with the scriptures, where we're teaching you how to develop a daily uh, prayer routine. And we're actually going to finally finish our web page called the Bible Initiative, where you can go to find external resources to help you along your journey in reading God's word and engaging with it outside of church on Sunday morning or Monday night. Uh, that's one of our biggest passions. That's one of my biggest passions at Enrich is to teach you how to engage with God's word on your own and how to read it for yourself and how to even compare it and, you know, uh, make sure that I'm teaching it properly as your pastor. And that's really important. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, you can go to Isaiah 51 and we're going to be reading from verse nine to 23 today. It's kind of long, but it's good. It's a good portion of scripture. We're going to dive right into it. If you go to our website at www.enrichregina.com, you can actually go and click on notes and you can follow along with our sermon notes for this week right on the website as you listen to this. So I highly encourage it, encourage you to do that. And I really uh, encourage you to share our podcast, share it with your friends if you enjoy. You no, know, people do listen to this and we have a good solid audience. Uh, if you know, if you th- gain value from this, if you think it's great, if you are growing through this, I really want to encourage you to share it with your friends and share it with people, you know, uh, share it with people that don't know Christ because we share the gospel every time we preach and uh, see what they have to say about it. Okay, let's read Isaiah 51, verse 9 to 23. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransom of the Lord will return and come with a joyful shouting to Zion. And and everlasting joy will be on their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I, even I, am he who confronts, or sorry, he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, and of the Son of Man who is made like grass? That you have forgotten the Lord your Maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. That you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor, as he makes ready to destroy? But where is the fury of the oppressor? The exile will soon be set free and will not die in the dungeon, nor will his bread be lacking. For I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of its, a Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to found the earth, to say to Zion, you are my people. Rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, 
You who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling, you have drained to the dregs. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne, nor is there one to take her by the hand among all the sons she has reared. These two things have befallen you. Who will mourn for you? The devastation and destruction, famine and sword. How shall I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie helpless at the head of the, every street, like an antelope in a net, full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, even your God who contends for his people, behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger. You will never drink it again. I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you. You have even made your back like the ground and like the street for those who walk over it. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, this is a, there's a huge chunk of scripture and this is the second half of Isaiah 51. And uh, the context of this, as we learned in the past doing this Isaiah series, is that God has brought his people out of judgment now. God has brought his people out of this judgment, out of this state where they are going through this judgment, that they're going through this consequence of living through their sin. And we can see this in the beginning of Isaiah 1.4. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. This is Isaiah 1.4. So God's people were turning away from him. They were literally worshiping a false God while worshiping uh, God in, in the temple. So they were, you know, worshiping Baal and then all of a sudden they would go in on, on the temple on Saturday, you know, during their Sabbath as good Jews do, and they would be worshiping God, but their hearts would be defiled and their hearts would be full of sin. And they were dead in their spirit because of that. They were, uh, you know, and that's for all of us. We're all born into sin and we all make mistakes and God's people has made a mistake here. And so God wants to correct them. He wants to bring them through this trial, wants to bring them through judgment. And now in Isaiah 50 onward, we're actually, actually technically Isaiah 45, God is now showing them the promises that lie before them. God is now bringing them out of that judgment, fulfilling his promise of correcting them and then bringing them hope and grace and saving them from their sin. So I want to ask you something today as we get started. I want you to think about the mistakes you have made. I want you to think about, you know, even if there's a mistake you have made that you absolutely regret or that you wish you could have back in your past. And I want you to think about that right now. Think about even if there's a mistake or something in your life that's happening right now that is causing you to fall into depression, that's causing you even to be stressed out and to not be doing well personally. And I just want you, you know, today, the message of the sermon is no match for God. And I want you to think about all those mistakes you have made because we've all made them. We have all made mistakes. We all have stuff we don't want aired out in public. We all have stuff in our hearts that we need to give back to God in repentance we all go through that. And by the way, we are going to make mistakes in the future. <coughs> we are going to go out and we're going to make mistakes down the road because we are sinful people. We are born into sin. That means that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They gained more knowledge, which brought on more responsibility, which brought on sin and now the penalty of that is death. And notice how in Isaiah, God isn't talking to everyone. God's not talking to the whole world. We even looked at last uh, our last sermon on September 4th. You can listen to it. We actually looked at how God is speaking 
specifically to the righteous at the beginning of Isaiah 51, chapter one says, look at you righteous or call out, or I'm calling out to you righteous. God is literally calling out to the righteous. Listen to me, who you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. See, God is talking to his people here. He's not talking to a specific, you know, he's not talking to the whole world. He's not talking to the lost. He is talking to his people. And as his people, his people know better than to mix their worship with a false God and to sin and run away from God's holy covenant and agreement with them. It's just like myself. I won't treat other people's kids the same way I treat my kids. I just won't. My kids, I will discipline more. I will have a higher standard for my kids because they live with me. They know who I am. They know what my rules are. And other kids coming from outside the group won't know those things all the time because they don't know me. And I will expect my own kids to have a higher standard than some random person's kids because we live to a certain standard in my family. We worship God. We love God. And we want to live lives, our lives out excellently in my family. So my family, my kids will be treated differently than some other random person's kids that aren't in my family. And that's exactly what God is doing here with his people. God's people know better. They are living with the one true God, the holy God of the universe. So they will be disciplined by God. They will be corrected by God. And they will be held to the high standard that God has given him. So the, the sermon title today is No Match for God. And this leads into our first point that we learned from the scriptures. Nothing oppresses God. Nothing destroys God. There is no sin, no evil, no terrible deed, no evil deed that will defeat God. Not even death can defeat God. God has the victory over everything on this planet, over every demonic force, over everything in our lives. He has the victory. So be patient and rest in God. This is what it says in Isaiah 51, 9 to 13. Uh, it reminds us that the reader, it reminds the reader that God has the victory over everything that has come against his people, including themselves. When we read what, what is brought up with Rahab, Rahab literally means pride. God is commanding and celebrating his victory over the serpent that is Satan. Verse 11 also points us directly towards revelation and how God is going to bring the new Jerusalem in and save the righteous into eternal life with him. Let's read that quickly together to pull that out of that scripture. Awake, awake, put on strength, O armor of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep? If you go down to 13, that, it, that you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor. So God's people are scared because of the oppressor. God's people are scared because of the judgment they've gone through and the Babylonian nation has attacked them and brought judgment on them. And this has brought fear into God's people. And you know, Isaiah, the prophet is saying, awake, awake, put on strength, the arm of the Lord, put on the strength of the Lord. Was it not the Lord who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? You know, was it not the Lord who cut pride into pieces, who pierced the dragon, who literally defeated the serpent and the snake and who will defeat the serpent and the snake, not only on the cross and through the resurrection of coming out of the grave, but even in Revelation, the Lord defeats the dragon. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway? And that's God's people coming out of Exodus or coming out of Egypt in Exodus. That's God's people literally walking on the floor bed of the Red Sea. So because that's the power that God has over the sea. For the redeemed to cross over, so the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion and everlasting joy will be on their heads. You see, Isaiah is prophesying the deliverance of God's people from their sin into eternal life with God. 
And that is going to be through Jesus Christ. And he's pointing to the past and saying, was it not the Lord who brought you out of captivity? Was it not the Lord who did all these wonderful things? Was it not the Lord who delivered you through Rahab, a prostitute who saved your people? And then, you know, God cut pride. God has cut your pride into pieces because he has used, you know, these unproud or, or not so proud moments in our history. And this is what Isaiah is saying here. And this, this shows us that God has the victory over everything. God is victorious. Uh, it says in verse 13 that you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of your oppressor as he makes ready to destroy. Don't fear your oppressor. Fear the Lord, because the Lord is above your oppressor. Where is the fury of the oppressor compared to the fury of the Lord? And even the Lord comforts us. He who are that you are afraid of man who dies. So Isaiah is saying you are afraid of man, but you are afraid of someone and something that perishes, that dies. And God does not perish. God does not die. Therefore, don't be afraid of the man who perishes. Fear God. Walk in presence with the Lord. He will come for you. He does come for you. He delivers you through judgment and out of judgment and into hope. And we have to understand that he does this because he loves us. And Isaiah is trying to remind his people, don't fear man, fear the Lord. Don't think man has power over the Lord because he doesn't. God has the victory over all of that stuff. So stop thinking you have the control and you can do it on your own. Stop doing things out of uh, irrational fear of uh, an army that will perish because it's full of men. This is what Isaiah is saying here. And then he continues to go on talking about the exile. But before we get to that, this actually points to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20. In the gospel of Luke, this is the, this is the context of this passage we find that Jesus is reminding the 77 people of the power that he has over the, the demonic forces. Nothing oppresses God. Nothing stands a chance against God. This is what Jesus says in Luke 10, 17 to 20. These 77 all went out on ministry. They were empowered by Jesus to go do this. They were given authority through the Holy Spirit and Christ to go do ministry. And all these crazy things start happening. They start casting out demons. They start seeing God just delivering people from evil. And this is what Jesus says. The 77 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I am watching Satan or I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You see, Jesus is reminding his people here. You've seen these amazing things. You've done these amazing things, but just remember, it's not you doing those things. It's me. Don't rejoice in your deeds. Rejoice in the glory and the power that God has offered and that God is doing through you. It's all because of God. The victory of our salvation, the victory over demonic forces, the victory over all of that stuff is nothing we have achieved. It's all because of God's grace and God's truth that he's given us. And God has delivered his people from that. And that is what the point of this is today. This leads us into our second point. You see, nothing stands a chance against God, even the circumstances we find ourselves in especially when they are terrifying. This is what it's, you know, this leads us to our second point. God brings judgment upon his people to make them righteous, to cleanse them of their sin and bring them closer in relationship with him. See, the exile in this passage is that of God's people, Jerusalem. We saw last night at Enrich, this continual repetition of the words, awake, awake, or rouse yourself, rouse yourself. You know, uh, Isaiah chapter or 51 verse 9 Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, God. Awake, 
you people put on the strength of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations long ago. And then they're calling out for God's power and help. In verse 17, rouse yourself, rouse yourself. Arise, O Israel, or O Jerusalem, you who you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling, you have drained to the dregs. And then God says in verse 14, the exile will soon be set free. You will not die in the dungeon, nor will his bread be lacking. You see, God is speaking directly at Jerusalem, who has just went through terrible judgment by the Babylonian Empire. And when it talks about the, the cup of his fury, you know, this is what Enduring Word Commentary says. A common picture of judgment in the Old Testament is the cup of God's wrath or fury. The idea is that God gives a cup of full of his wrath to those who are under judgment, and they must drink it. Here, God calls Jerusalem to remember that they have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury when they experience God's judgment through the Babylonians. God is reminding them, don't forget about the judgment you just went through. Don't forget about those mistakes you have made in your past. Learn from them. Don't become complacent and fall into the same patterns again. And it continues to point to Jesus. This is amazing. Not only did Jerusalem drink the cup of judgment, but they also drained it, drinking down to the dregs at the bottom of the cup. They had experienced desolation, destruction, famine, and sword. And this was God's cup for them. And this powerful image was in the mind of Jesus when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion. When he prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this is Luke twenty two forty two. He had this in mind, the cup of God's wrath. He was about to drink to the dregs at the cross. And what's crazy is that God's people deserved this judgment, this cup of judgment, because of their sin. The thing about Christ is that Christ is 100% man, 100% God. He's perfect. He's sinless. He does not deserve a cup of judgment. Yet he still has one and he still drank one and he still bore judgment for us on the cross. That's how much God loves us. That's how much God loves his people. He's literally paving the way in Isaiah 51 to show his people that I will bear your cup of judgment. I will drain your cup of judgment. I will drink it down to the dregs where you won't have to anymore. And this is what God is preparing in Isaiah 51. Again, this is why the evil things of the world and our mistakes and our missteps are no match for God's mercy, grace, and truth. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians about how Jesus continually makes those who believe in him more righteous like him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This directly compares to Isaiah 51, 16. I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to found the earth, and to say to Zion, you are my people. You see, God has put words in the exiles, Jerusalem's mouth, and has covered them with the shadow of his hand. God has established the heavens in order to make the earth. God is doing the work. He has already defeated sin. He has already defeated death by rising back from the grave three days after Jesus was crucified. So we need to stop trying to do it all on our own, run back to Jesus, rest in him, repent to him, and awaken to this truth. And this is what Isaiah is trying to tell his people, God's people, in this context. He's trying to tell them, you are exiles, but God is 
going to set you free. You will not die in this dungeon. You will not be lacking for bread. You will come out of this judgment. You will be made new in God and he will love you and you will be close to him. Don't trust in men who die. Trust in the man who is perfect, who is Jesus, who is God. This is what it says in verse 18. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has born, nor is there one to take her by the hand among all the sons she has reared. These two things have befallen you. Who will mourn for you? The devastation and destruction, famine and sword. How shall I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. Don't trust in the sons of Jerusalem. Trust in the Lord. Full of the wrath of the Lord, they, the rebuke of your God. God is full of wrath and rebuke. And we saw in 2 Corinthians that we just read that God bears the wrath on himself as Jesus. He doesn't want Jerusalem to stay the afflicted. He doesn't want them to stay in their cup of judgment. He doesn't want to always be angry at them. He uses that anger, uses that judgment to correct his people to bring them into a life of righteousness with him. And then he wants them to share that good news with the world. He wants them to be a light on a hill, a beacon of his hope and his truth and his grace. And this is the message of Isaiah 51. You see, God knows his people have been through a time of judgment. And now he's showing them the end. You will be with me forever in paradise and heaven we will have Zion. We will have victory over all of this stuff that you have feared. All the mistakes that you have made. I have victory over all of that. This leads us into our third point. The greatest temptation is to become complacent, to fall asleep, to not learn from our times of sin and consequence. We must never forget about God's love and truth for us. You see, we... We see this repeating pattern of awake, awake, put on strength, armor the Lord, right? The writer here is telling God to awaken and is telling the people to call on God. And then in Isaiah 51, 17, rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand, the cup of his anger. The Lord has brought his people through this time of trial and judgment. Now they must wake up. As the Lord is bringing them out of exile, learn from what they have went through and never forget what sin and mistakes brought them into judgment in the first place. This is what Enduring Word Commentary says. The Lord knows when to give the cup and he knows when to take it from his people. God's timing is perfect. Now is the time for their redemption and for the shame of their enemies. So the Lord promises. We should always be awake to God's timing and loving promises. This is what Charles Spurgeon says. When faith is weak, men are in a dreadful hurry, but strong faith does not judge the Lord to be slack concerning his promises as God achieves his purpose with infinite leisure. He loves a faith that is patient and looks not for its reward this day or the next. He, he that believeth, believeth shall not make haste. That is to say, he shall not be ashamed or confounded by present trials by as to run or to rush upon unbelieving actions. Faith leaves times and seasons with God to whom they belong. I just love that. When faith is weak, men are in a dreadful hurry. I love that quote. When our faith is weak, when our trust is weak, when we're, when we're not fully trusting in God's promises and what God is offering here, we become in a dreadful hurry, full of worry full of anxiety, full of information overload, full of constant discontentment. And this is exactly why God's people continually make the mistakes of running into false worship, running into habitual sin as a community. You see, we cannot become complacent in our faith. We can't forget that we used to be dead in our sin. And now when we have faith in Christ and Christ alone, it's his work, not our work. We don't, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by the power of his gospel, the power of him dying on the cross and defeating death by rising himself three days later. That power has given us hope 
and given us peace. And we should, that should be a reminder for us to not go into our habitual sin. Because if God loves us that much, then who are we to spin at that and to not love God back by causing ourselves to sin and fall into temptation? And this is uh, like God wants us to be awakened in our spiritual selves. He wants us to be aware. He doesn't want us to go through life as Christians, as Christ followers, just kind of like zombies and barely even moving forward and kind of like dregs. He doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to be alive in him, sharing the hope that he's given us going out into the world and seeing the power that he does and the work that he does through us as we share the gospel, just like those 77 in the, in the book of Luke. I think it's such a good reminder of reading Isaiah 51 today and being reminded of that as Christians. And I want to ask you, what are those mistakes in your life that are holding you back? They are no match for the Lord and the power that he's offering. Your sin your mistakes, your past, your anger, your impatience, your sinful human temptations. They're no match for God's victory. No match for God's love, for God's redeeming power. God loves you. Give all that stuff to God. He will forgive you. He loves you. Wake up and follow the one true God. The God who is still alive. The God who came back to life three days later. The God that is sitting on the throne that is the Holy Spirit working on us. And one day Jesus Christ will come back and bring the righteous into heaven with him. And that's the promise that we get to look forward to. And it's a gift that God has given us, this gift of grace that we get to celebrate, that we get to be joyful over, and that we get to share with one another. Uh, I shared at a young adult retreat this last weekend, and I implemented these three R's. Rest, remind, remain. And we need to rest in the Lord always. Taking our Sabbaths, taking our rests, taking two days off in a row. If you are not taking your Sabbath and rest, then you need to change that. Become more disciplined. Figure it out. Move your schedule around so that you can be continually resting because you will burn out. You will fall short. You will you might even lose your faith at times. You might even doubt God because you feel like you're overworked and you don't have that that time to reflect on him, that time to stop and pause and look back on your journals. And it's so important to remember to take your Sabbath. And that's what rest is. And then we have remind. We need to remind ourselves of the gospel. We need to remind ourselves of our past, of where we've come from, of our mistakes that God has worked us through. We need to understand that God has delivered us from all that sin and all those mistakes and remind ourselves of the power of the gospel. And then as we go out and share the gospel and do his work and ministry, we have to rem remain in the Lord. We have to, you know, as we go out, we have to remain in his power, remain in his truth, remain, you know, instead of being spiritually dead and being hypocrites and just performing for God, we need to have our hearts focused and steadied on God. And that's exactly what remaining means. And as we remain in the Lord, then he will do amazing things through us. He will, we will see people come to know him. We will see people coming back to him. We will see God, we will, we will see God planting seeds where we couldn't even have dreamed that seeds could be planted in the first place. And that is exactly the process of a disciple of Christ and becoming closer to Christ, resting in him, reminding of his gospel remaining in him as you go out. Just never forget that there's no mistake you have made to cause God to abandon you. God doesn't abandon us. We abandon him. We walk away from him. We run away from him. But he's always there ready for us when we come back to him. And this is what Isaiah 51 is teaching us. Nothing oppresses God. Nothing destroys God. Not even death. God brings judgment on his people to make them righteous, to clean them of their sin, to bring them closer in relationship with him. The greatest temptation is to become complacent, to fall asleep, to not learn from our times of sin and consequence. We must never forget about God's true love for us. This is what Isaiah 51 has taught us today. There is no match. 
for God. None of our sin, none of our, even our trials that we go through teach us more about God. That's how powerful God is. God works in all of the areas of our life, the good areas, the bad areas, and the nasty areas that we're too afraid to share. And I just want to encourage you with that today. Thank you so much for listening. And I just uh, pray that you'll be blessed by the sermon today. If you have any questions, you can email us, info at enrichregina.com. And if you want to give to our ministry, you can go to our website, www.enrichregina.com slash give. All your options for giving are there. And we cannot wait to see you here back again next week as we continue our series in Isaiah. Have a great day.